we'll wait a little bit, um, you know, uh, a few minutes. So until everyone um, join in. So for those joining in, welcome all. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be going uh, live and starting the webinar in a couple of minutes. Just waiting for everyone to, um, to log in and For those um, joining in, we're just waiting a little bit uh, for a couple of minutes until we start the webinar. Thank you. Okay, so we will um, start. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for taking time to connect to today's webinar, OTT in MENA, Potential Pay Services. My name is uh, Shana Rafter, Event Manager at Dataxis, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Before we start, I'd like to introduce you all to the Head of Events at Dataxis, Priscilla Tiervengadom, who will give us a quick overview of the market in MENA. So Priscilla, the screen will be yours in thank you. one Good minute. Good morning, uh, everyone. So thank you very much, Shana. Can I have, please, the hand? Yep, here you go. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us uh, today for today's webinar organized by Datexis. So as my colleague mentioned, so before starting uh, the discussion panel, Datexis will share some key figures and insight of the MENA market. So as you may be aware, Datexis has launched its new intelligence portal, the first data on demand platform for TV, telecom, media, and digital industries, where you can access more than, more than uh, plus 45,000 data, more than 1,400 active profile, and over 600 market reports. I'd invite you to sign in, to sign up, and enjoy the free, free uh, credit to discover the platform. So coming to the uh, subject. So the Middle East and North Africa region regroup countries from uh, North Africa to Iran, including Perth Gulf uh, countries. So that axis estimate that, the, that there are around 450 million inhabitants representing roughly 105 million household with 62 million TV household, which is relatively a high level of household equipped with a TV. But the figure hides some inequalities in the region. For example, in Yemen, according to data access figures for 2019, we have a TV penetration of 75%, whereas in Morocco, it stands at 
94%, and in Kuwait, we have a TB penetration of uh, 99%. So coming to the next slide. So just to, to uh, mention to you is that you will notice that in this uh, presentation, we choose not to include Turkey, Sudan, and Israel because they have big differences in terms of TV and video market development. So Turkey would also impact on all graph as it is big and uh, a very big and populated country. So moving to, to the next slide, we have a look at the connectivity status in the region. So as you can see, there is a significant growth in fixed and mobile connections. So uh, for example, FTTX development is uh, occurring in particular cities and dense areas. So that access also predict a significant portion of 5G in the region. So the MENA region has been at the forefront of innovative network development. So country like Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, Saudi, UAE and Oman are launching commercial 5G offers for individuals. Again, we, we can see that uh, the access to the internet is quite heterogeneous in the region. Some countries like UAE, Bahrain, or Katane already have penetration rate of over 100% for only 4G and 5G SIM, while in North Africa, the development of connectivity is slower, both on fixed and mobile. So moving to the next slide. So Middle East and uh, North Africa has a huge potential for the development of OTT streaming services. So our panelists today will uh, talk about that. So broadcasters, production and uh, distribution companies are going online to adapt to the audience demand. And the environment also in MENA is favorable, favorable for, for the growth of streaming video services. On the left graph, we can visualize that exists focus on the SVOD segment, which is a spectrum of service of video and demand based on subscription model. So, so it is important to note that there is an abundance of actors from various markets, namely AVOD that are 100% ad supported. So YouTube being the most famous platform for this model. So we have freemium uh, platform also mean that user can access and access and see content with advertising, but there is a push strategy to make the user subscribe to access premium content and also to avoid ads. So mobile operator like already TV or DU view are accessible through a mobile subscription. So we have seen that the growth of the market will still be linked to the development of reliable and affordable connectivity, especially in uh, North Africa. So the access to digital payment method and the building of a sustainable cooperation between content providers, broadcasters, and distributors. I now invite you to, to and I now invite you to dive into the discussion panel. So I'll give the hand to Shana. So thank you very much. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, before introducing today's panelists, I'd like to remind the audience that you're welcome to use the question, send us, sorry, send us a question using the Q&A section via the platform and also use the live chat section if you wish to communicate to panelists or attendees. And we aim to make uh, it as interactive as possible. So, well, today we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. Uh, firstly, it is with great privilege to have with us Zara Zayat, the Senior Vice President Digital OTT and Telco at OSN, who has, under her leadership, relaunched OSN with over 10,000 hours of content. Zara is passionate about reinventing the future of television and revolutionizing the way content is viewed across the MENA region. Welcome, Zara. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Also an honor here with us is the CEO of Erosnow, Ali Hussein. Erosnow is the premier Indian OTT platform of Eros International, 
with over 15 years of experience in the media, entertainment and digital space, Ali joined AerosNow to lead the brand's vision to be the customer's first choice for digital entertainment. Thanks, Ali, for being here with us today. Good afternoon to all and thank you, Shana. Pleasure to be here with all the panelists. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, we'd like to welcome Nadine Samra, Chief Business Officer at Wayak.com by Z Entertainment. Nadine wants the Arabic digital business and is responsible from the digital transformation at Wayak, the Arabic OTT platform with over 12,000 hours of Indian content dubbed into Arabic. Very warm welcome to you, Nadine. Thanks Hi, for being thank here. Thank you for having oh, we me. Have, excellent. So we have seen that the Middle Eastern market have a large potential for growth in terms of size and value. However, the OTT mark environment is becoming more and more competitive with a wide range of actors competing with streaming giants like Netflix and Amazon Prime. So my first question to all three will be, how do you see yourself positioned within the range of services available on the market? And what are the growth drivers that you have identified with building your strategy? Perhaps, Zara, you want to go first with OSN? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Shana, and uh, thanks everyone for having, for attending and making the time today. Um, uh, true, indeed, MENA is, is a very uh, fertile market and uh, it has quite a strong appetite for OTT content. It has become very, very crowded in the last uh, few years and uh, mainly during the COVID lockdown period where people have, um, have, have, uh, have, have got more awareness about e-commerce and OTT. And we've uh, seen a significant spike in consumption and engagement across all OTT platforms. And this has, has, has has, uh, has increased the competition today in the OTT world, despite that it is very crowded with, with local players. It also has attracted international players, the likes of uh, Netflix and Amazon. Now you hear about HBO Max and, and Peacock and, and all of the other international players having their eyes on this market. It is a big market with big potential and a strong uh, appetite. The way we position our product, and we, when we did our relaunch in, uh, in April, uh, we wanted to send the message that OSN is now digital. We've got digital in our genes. Um, we've launched our new app, new look and feel, and, uh, and we wanted to position it as the cutting edge digital over the top platform. Um, pioneering uh, in the space of digital entertainment and being home of exclusive award-winning premium content. So uh, to achieve that, we've launched Disney Plus exclusive on our platform. Uh, same for HBO and, uh, and uh, many of the major Hollywood studios. But we also um, uh, took into consideration that we are in the MENA region, so, uh, so we have Arabic as mainstream. Uh, our audience is a mix between Western and Arabic speakers, so we've dedicated a section for Arabic speakers, another section for uh, kids as well. Uh, the idea is that we want to become uh, an all-in-one place hub for entertainment and, um, and uh, since our launch, um, which happened just uh, during the COVID uh, lockdown period, um, we've been doubling our numbers. Uh, it went amazingly well, still going well. Uh, engagement uh, spiked and uh, and uptake was was really good. Uh, however, um, uh, this puts more pressure on us because uh, because we've got to to compete now with international players 
as well as mm -hmm. uh, local players in the market. And, um, and it's, it's not an easy game. People are after strong content. So uh, you will see an appetite of people having multiple OTT platforms um, in their homes now. So they will have uh, Netflix and Amazon and OSN and Wayak and, and uh, uh, probably Eros as well. So, um, so the appetite is, is huge. Now, uh, strategically, how, 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 what, are, what are our main strategic um, components for, for success? Today in the world of uh, OTT, we focus on um, content, content being a big winner in the world of OTT, technology platform and experience. That's a very important aspect. You look into uh, the market today, uh, Netflix does not have the best content, but they have the best user experience and the best journey. Uh, they're very close to people in the way they position their product. So technology experience and platform is very important. And then the other aspect is digital and performance marketing. And the uh, fourth aspect that we have is a focus on our very brilliant, experienced, energe energetic team. Uh, the team who has participated in the launch of Disney Plus and the launch of, of, of the new platform. So um, it is really people, content, technology, platform, digital and performance marketing, and then localization, being close to people. Excellent. That's really, really interesting to hear that. Ali, do you want to add to, to what Eros now is, is doing? Yeah, I think uh, one of the challenges of going second or third is because a lot of us will have similar answers <laughs> to how we think about the larger strategy, right? So I'm going to try and yeah. um, uh, complement what kind of Zara said, right? And kind of give you a little bit of a uh, quick introduction. So you know, it's not, it's not a commonly known fact, but it was an early adopter um, out of India and then kind of grew its presence globally. We currently have, um, as of last reported, which was uh, Q3 for our uh, financial year FY20, um, 186.2 million registered users around the world and close to about 26.2 million paid subs, right? So uh, a fairly large kind of consumer universe around the world. Um, I think the, the core part of the business started off as a strategy to be focused on what we call is like the South Asian content uh, play. Um, and that was historically an important part of what we did as a culture. Um, and as, over the last couple of years in specific, we've started focusing on what we call is our adjacent markets, right? In the Middle East, for example, is home to... <clears throat> excuse me, significant number of South Asian population. But what is interesting about the Middle East is that most of the audience base um, actually consumes, the South Asian audience base actually consumes the South language Indian content. Um, it's in a lot of the local population, the Arab population actually, that consumes the so-called Bollywood of the Indian content, right? And we have about 12,000 films on the platform that are available in the region as an example. So it's a fairly large and a vast offering with high quality kind of film, feature film kind of programming that people have watched over the years. Um, especially in the last couple of years to kind of uh, further deep dive into what Zara mentioned was, uh, we're looking at a couple of areas, how we're able to become a more local player rather than what a global player does in a local market. It's how do you become a more local player, right? And if you look at, uh, there are about three different facets which are very interesting when you look at how do you look at localization. One is, um, look looking at the existing content and how it's consumed more from a user experience standpoint, whether it's user interface or whether it's things like um, subtitles and dubbing. And I'll come to some interesting pieces later on in this discussion on what we're doing on technology to kind of give you a sense right. of the depth of what we're going into. Um, the second thing which is interesting is looking at how we're able to transcend and look at potentially stories that are relevant to the region. Um, because stories by nature tend to be global, but how do you make stories that connect with the audience at a deeper level? So whilst we think that you know, licensing content and having international content is great, how do we look at local content or content that is uh, culturally suited more locally? Um, there are a couple of interesting projects that we're also embarking upon, which will be in the space of co-production. So stories that might be relevant to a couple of close, uh, closely knit regions of the world, right? Which allow you to kind of travel borders also. And the third, and then I've, I've said this in a lot of the conversations I've had uh, uh, publicly, is that um, our business 
unfortunately becomes what we call as a hit and miss business, right? It's from show to show, film to film. Mm -hmm. um, how do you create that brand? It's about creating that brand and making it familiar, right? It's almost like you know that this is the brand known for this kind of product. And this is the product, if you visit it, this is the kind of quality of the experience. So it's making it beyond transactional. I feel a lot of the world today is based on transaction because we talk about shows that we like to watch. Uh, you know, I'm not saying the platform needs to become important, but I spent some time about 10 years ago with, with MTV and it's, it's the work that also goes into creating a brand. If, if you talk about how do you create a larger yeah. brand just beyond the particular show. So I'd like to believe that these are three things that culminate into creating a consumer relationship because at the end of the day, we are in the consumer business. So we've got to make it beyond, the consumers don't understand tech, the consumers don't understand a lot of that kind of complicated work going on at the back end. How do you create that brand affinity or what we call as brand love? And I think these are the combination of three things that we're working on extensively in the region to make sure that we're more local. Uh, we create certain aspects of brand love and brand affinity and to ensure that we're able to create the localization of the product level. And I think that's the key part of our strategy going forward. Perfect. Um, I'll, I'll think, Nadine, you want to brush off on, on that? Just mention uh, what yeah, Wayak yeah. is. Absolutely. I'll, maybe I'll take it in a, a little bit different way. What I'd uh, like mm. to brief the audience first is about Wayak and uh, what we actually do. So Wayak is a, a video on demand platform targeting the Arabic audience, wherever they are globally. So we are a, a global platform nature. Of course, we're coming out of the MENA region because the, the, the concentration of the Arabic audience is in MENA and the, the highest potential is here. Uh, but we are also available worldwide. Our uh, model is freemium model. So in the MENA region, we are AVOD, SVOD. And this is uh, critical because it, it, all, uh, it, it talks about all of our strategies. So this sums up um, our strategies and our, um, uh, what we think about the market in MENA in particular. So we are AVOD, SVOD in MENA. Outside of MENA, we are completely subscription uh, for the Arabic audience. I think what is really important is to know um, your target audience and what you are trying to serve to that audience in order to find um, to your brand a place uh, in this crowded market, as my uh, as the other panelists have um, explained. Um, so uh, accordingly, you will be able to realize who your competitors are. So in in many cases, I get into some panels or discussions, and people start throwing different names about being, um, you know, competitors to Wayak or Wayak's competitor to them and so on and so forth. While in my opinion, I think um, the idea of uh, competition um, is, is uh, very specific. It's not like anybody who works on the VOD or a VOD platform is a competition to other uh, platforms. Uh, what is really competition is basically VODs who target the same uh, target audience at the same time have something similar to your offering or uh, maybe your USP is, is similar to them. This is where, where actually the, the, the competition comes into place. While um, if the uh, target audience is completely different, then uh, definitely they are not uh, competitors to you. And if their uh, target audience is probably wider or your audience is niche audience to them, also it's, it's different. Uh, so I think all of these uh, elements really play, play a role uh, in the way that you evaluate the market, you evaluate your brand, and you evaluate your presence. Um, that being, being said, uh, just so that you know as well, and for the audience to realize uh, where we come from, Wayak is part of uh, Z Entertainment, and Z Entertainment is a global player, Indian player. Uh, we have a large uh, library of content, uh, um, but Wayak is not, does not only uh, uh, you know, host uh, Indian content, actually, 40% uh, of our uh, Wayak library is Indian dubbed into Arabic content, while the rest of the content is uh, Arabic content acquired um, and um, some produced and some, uh, and, and, you know, basically um, that's um, exclusive content to Wayak. That's great. Um, so you mentioned something about freemium. So we'll get that. The next question will be, we'll be digging more into this. So with a, with a strong um, satellite FTA market and forefront runners like NBC on the market, already transi transitioning to digital uh, with ad supported platforms, uh, it appears that, you know, there's a significant market penetration of the freemium uh, streaming services. How do you, um, how do you, um, Nadine, encourage uh, viewers to pay for, for their content? Because you did mention there is the, the uh, way app does have the, this SVOD um, option as well when, when there are a, an array of, of options available online for free. 
uh, yeah, I'd like to, to start with the idea of why we are uh, AVOD in this market. I hugely believe uh, that there are challenges here in, in the MENA region. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, uh, having, you know, free to air uh, TV channels. So everyone is used to the idea of having content for free. Uh, so yeah. uh, always uh, trying to sell them content is a tricky thing, although things have changed, of course, with the, you know, the, the having global players coming into the market and so on. So year on year, we see that the sub subscription idea is resonating within the uh, MENA region audience or the Arabic audience in particular. So this is the first challenge that we need to look at. The second one is the piracy. And, uh, you know, having more, like most of the content, any content that comes new into the market, you see all of the people going and trying to get that content uh, for free or pirate it. Even if it's available uh, in a free way, in a legitimate uh, website, people always think of going into the pirated uh, areas uh, uh, to find that content. So uh, putting these two points in, in perspective, uh, for us as uh, Z Entertainment, we thought that Wayag as a brand and as a product targeting Arabic audience, we need to go AVOD at the beginning. And this is what we have done um, four years back, three years back since the launch. Um, a few months uh, back, six months back, we introduced the subscription in the MENA region. And we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, advertising it or marketing it gradually to the audience to show them the added benefit out of this, uh, of the subscription. How we drive uh, uh, people towards subscription is through the uh, con exclusive content, original content. Right now we have a package of around 12 uh, original content from Z5 digitally uh, only available in Arabic on, uh, on Wayak. So this is under the subscription. Uh, we also have uh, things like no ads, uh, ad free. Uh, we uh, also are trying to introduce the 4K content into the platform plus other features such as the download feature on your uh, mo mobile app. So, uh, so there are plenty of steps to encourage people to go into the, to the subscription. I don't think it's an easy journey here in MENA due to the reasons that I've uh, already uh, talked about. Excellent. Um, uh, Zara, you wanna set something? Zara, you on mute. Oh yeah, great. Yeah, that's sure. That's sure. Uh, uh, when the MENA, the MENA market by, by nature is not a market that likes to pay for content in general and people are used to consuming content for free uh, the majority of the time but um, I believe with, uh, with, with the digital transformation that is happening and, and people uh, getting more digitally savvy um, uh, they, 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 they got used to uh, kind of the idea of, of paying for TV and paying for content that they want to watch. Uh, so content is always a driver. Uh, having exclusive premium content is always a driver. I'll give an example, the example of uh, Game of Thrones, uh, mm -hmm. which is the big, big, big title uh, for us on, uh, from HBO, exclusive on Oh, I said, uh, um, uh, people were jumping on our platform because they are looking to, to see this content um, and, and, and they've subscribed to watch this content. And, um, and despite the whole seasons have been, have been uh, out in the market till now, we still see people coming into the platform. And the first thing they watch is, uh, is, is the first, uh, episode of the first season of Game of Thrones. So, 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 um, so, despite um, uh, despite the piracy and despite uh, the FTA channels, people will keep looking for premium content, and this is what we provide. Uh, in our case, as an OTT platform, uh, bringing on board Disney Plus. We saw also a lot of uh, people who have subscribed to Disney Plus via VPN. So, so mm -hmm. this shows you the appetite in the market. Uh, people still use VPN to get more access into content um, on Netflix, on uh, on uh, on HBO, on uh, on Disney Plus as well. And this is this is where where our role comes into play as 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 an OSN streaming platform 
So whenever people try to access the services via VPN, we come on board and we tell them uh, this content is available via the OSN streaming app. That's one example. The other thing is, is piracy. Uh, yes, the growth of um, OTT video streaming revenue in, in, in the region is heavily impacted by content piracy. Uh, you know, most famous is, is, is VRQ and the use of mm -hmm. illicit streaming devices. Uh, however, um, we have taken down hundreds of pirated channels as well as millions of pirated uh, content on YouTube throughout the years. And uh, we try to use the digital watermarking uh, on our content. Um, despite that, pirate, pirates uh, keep on getting more, more and more uh, complex in the way of thinking. Um, and despite this commercial threat, um, we still believe that as both revenues will continue to grow. Uh, and uh, it will grow rapidly and people will continue to have an appetite to pay for premium content because um, one, because of the content exclusivity, two, because of uh, our ability to localize the content and to localize the way we approach customers in the mode of payment. We operate in a market where credit card penetration is low and it's extremely low in some of the areas. So, uh, so using multiple modes of payment is crucial, whether it's direct carrier billing or uh, cash or credit card or uh, vouchers. So, so multiple modes of payment uh, really help using the telcos as a mode of payment. In addition to that, uh, there is significant growth coming from 5G ready, uh, territories mainly coming from the uh, from the GCC countries who have more reliable mobile network. Uh, this enables OTT, and uh, it enables our ability to penetrate the market. The other thing is the pricing. The pricing of OTT platforms is considered in par with uh, with piracy. It's not expensive. Yeah. It's in the range of five to ten dollars. Uh, depending on the market, it's extremely rich. So people are losing their incentive now to go into, into uh, uh, pirated content because they've got the premium, they've got the exclusivity, they've got the right pricing point, the right mode of payment, the right uh, localized uh, service, and they've got um, guarantee on the quality of service as well. Yeah, that's, that's good. You, you've actually uh, touched a little bit of, um, you know, about low uh, credit card penetration and, and pricing. Well, we'll get into more uh, into that in details um, later on um, after, like later on. But Ali, I wanted to have, um, have this question to you as well, because um, Zara and, uh, and uh, Nadine mentioned, uh, you know, freemium and piracy. What, what's Eros now um, doing in, for that market? Um, Shana, specific to piracy? Are you talking about in terms of? No, free I'm content? talking. Uh, let's let's talk about free content, and then we'll 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 talk about piracy. How? Okay. Um, so I think um, historically, again, going back, right, um, a lot of the free content and the culture of free content started because uh, you know, like any um, early adopters, uh, people get accustomed, and YouTube is, for example actively known around the region and the entire principal business model of YouTube was driven by free and ad supported, right? So mm -hmm. that was essentially like the, what we call is the, uh, the proliferation of uh, VOD viewership in the market, right? It's almost like the gateway drug of sorts, um, kind of or it's how you expand the universe. So uh, we personally believe that uh, it's an evolution of the customer. It's an evolution of the infrastructure that Payment's not really a problem. Currently, the credit card penetration is low, but you have, as you mentioned in the data access slide, there are close to about over 110 million kind of paying households for pay TV, right? What's eventually going to start happening is you're going to start realizing that the number of options that are available, Zara pointed out, there's Peacock that's launched well, yesterday or today, uh, mm -hmm. HBO Max is coming out of the market, there's going to be multiple services. So there are 
two or three simple things. One is that the Middle East, Amina, in any case, is a multi-fragmented market between the expat population, between the working population, and between the local kind of Arab population. And, 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 and Egypt is very different from UAE, is very different from Saudi, right? So they're all kind of individual markets by itself. We tend to club them for ease of business purposes, but the consumer set in Egypt and Morocco is very different from the consumer set sitting in a UAE or a Saudi, for example. So uh, I think what's going to start happening is that people are going to have a lot more choice. Um, and the choice will be made of short form video is going to be more, um, I would say, acutely driven by free or ad supported. And um, corresponding to what my colleagues said, higher quality premium content, like the work that we do on large original series and films is always going to be behind paywall, right? You've paid historically for a theatrical ticket or you've paid for a pay TV subscription and you're also going to pay for an escort service. What mm -hmm. you're going to see is you're going to see a little bit of fragmentation of audiences based on mobile viewership, based on television viewership, but eventually this is, it's like a round circle. It's going to come back to your TV, right? It's just that the TV delivery is not necessarily going to happen through a, a kind of a one-way set-top box. It's going to be through a responsive box or a, some sort of a hardware ecosystem. So I think that's essentially where it's also headed, but it's just that the universe is going to be bigger. So we believe that this is just the overall kind of education of the ecosystem while to get climatized to the concept of OTT. Uh, and, and it's going to be much easier to get on the adoption curve because you're going to have things like voice discovery. You're going to have things like um, recommendation engines on steroids to make sure that you're able to understand or the machine understands what you want to watch. And people will relate to that uh, experience way better than they have on television or any other platform. So I think the, I guess, piracy at some level, and I'm going to bring that in for your ease of mm. Progression into your next question, but uh, a lot of these problems cease to exist because we tend, as a business, to put a lot of pressure for the ecosystem or for the business to deliver too soon. Um, there is a natural progression, and and uh, COVID has kind of forced that pace to get faster. So what we anticipated to happen in 2021 or early 2022 is probably kicked off in 2020 in terms of both the adoption or the inertia of crossing over uh, to the dark side of coming to the OTT world and also then people getting climatized to the experience of the content. So uh, we don't believe that it's going to be a concern or an issue for a long period of time, but we believe that brands need to stay focused in terms of, again, coming back to my first point on what's the brand relationship that you create and the experience that you create both with the tech and the content. Um, Nadine, did you want to mention a little bit about piracy? We, how, how, what is um, WAYAC doing? Um, Sure, I can do that. Uh, meanwhile, while I was listening to the uh, panelists, I was also having a look at the questions. And to be honest uh, with you, there are plenty of interesting questions that uh, yes, I, think I saw that. spent some time on it uh, uh, to discuss them. The, regarding the, the uh, uh, piracy, yes, there are um, lots of things that we are doing. Normally, our focus from a strategic perspective on the content that is exclusive to us, that's our first priority. Uh, the second priority would be the content that we actually acquire in the market and it's available on multiple platforms. Um, uh, accordingly, uh, we protect that content, that the, the, the content that we own, whether it is uh, um, you know, from our Z library or we have content that we have produced and so on, we make sure that it is completely secured, whether in, uh, on websites, uh, whether in uh, uh, YouTube, Google, anywhere else, right? The second thing that we do that I really like to focus on uh, in the market with our audience, with our viewers, is to tell them that there is no need for you guys to go and watch uh, pirated content because this content is available for free for you in Wayat with the best quality, best experience at your fingertips in any of your connected devices. So this is basically our key uh, uh, mandate and the most important uh, thing in our agenda is our marketing communication and message to our viewers is very clear. There is no need for you to go and watch that content in a pirated site. The reason why I'm emphasizing on this is that I see, despite the fact that Wayat is, is, uh, is an AVOT service in MENA and the user has the choice either to watch um, uh, the AVOT content or subscribe, I still see a lot of people going behind the pirated sites to watch our content. It's exactly the same content that's available in, in AVOD. And I believe that this is uh, our responsibility to block that content, that's for sure. But at the same time, our responsibility from a marketing perspective 
to clarify this to the audience. It means that we did not reach to the right audience to tell them, well, yeah, this content is available on Moyak. So it's a lot of work um, that goes into it, whether to fight uh, piracy from all of the uh, perspectives that we have uh, already talked about, uh, and at the same time, the responsibility in-house on us for a better brand positioning when it comes to our uh, end viewers. Excellent. So I'll, I'll just uh, um, move to the next question. So um, we will perhaps talk about creative innovation. So in terms of creative, we, we, we were talking about um, audiences and viewers. So um, there's a strong content positioning, um, you know, and cons 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 consumer demand. So what type of, of content drive audiences in, in your particular region? And also in terms of creative innovation, how do you engage and, and retain um, those, this audience like, and how do you measure this, this uh, success? Who wants to go first? Uh, Zara, Nadine? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so um, uh, I guess, I guess, despite that, we talk about it as as MENA region. Uh, each country in this region is different. Uh, they're different in their viewing behavior, and they're different in the way they consume uh, content. They're different in their content preferences as well. So uh, when we look into the content consumed in UAE versus uh, KSA, it's, it's different because the market um, uh, genetic is, is, is the market genes are, are different. Uh, I'll give you an example. When we launched uh, Hamilton, a big Disney Plus title exclusive on our platform, it showed a huge spike in UAE. And that's because the market here is uh, more westernized. It's, um, it's, it's a majority and expat market. However, um, it did not uh, see the same spike in, in KSA. It did not see the same spike in, in, um, in Kuwait. Um, so so before, uh, before we talk about what content works, it's really what content works in, in, uh, each, of the, in each of the countries we're serving. Uh, for each of the segments. Um, uh, there is uh, content uh, that drives acquisition and, um, and, and on that um, what we have seen is uh, today between Disney and HBO um, uh, we see 60% of the consumption of, of, on our platform is coming from, from these two uh, major studios, despite that we've got many, many, many other studios on board. Um, uh, but that's, that's content that, that drives acquisition. If you look into Saudi Arabia, it's actually a mix between Western and Arabic content that, that, that drives uh, the acquisition and the engagement uh, on our platform, same for Kuwait. And then, and then what keeps the customers engaged, what keeps the customers on our platform, it's, it's basically uh, not only the strong content positioning, but also educating the customers on what's on the platform, uh, understanding their viewing behavior, uh, the recommendation engines that come uh, uh, with it, and also the affinity and the affiliation uh, with a platform. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, so, so, so uh, today, uh, apart from having the exclusive premium content, it really attracts the customers, but also um, uh, uh, being being from the region, in the region, and 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 being in uh, being part of 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 people's life and and developing that that affinity. Uh, you know, it, it, it just develops that relationship between our product and, and the customer or the, or the subscriber. Um, on content specifically, I will, I will talk about Arabic as an example. So today we started um, our original production. We announced um, our, our original production, Come Dine With Me, uh, which will be produced in Saudi Arabia and UAE. Um, 
including talent uh, from Saudi and including talent from from UAE from the market. So so it is that kind of content that that people uh, feel related to and 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 they feel as part of the region as well. Okay, Ali, you want to say some some things? You want to elaborate on this? Sure. So, Shana, what's the specific direction you're looking for with the, with the, with the question? Oh, I, I'm sorry. It was mostly about the, um, the type of content and, uh, you know, that the drive um, audiences in the region, like, like Zara mentioned, you know, different regions have different uh, needs. Yeah. And, uh, so, and then also how, how do you uh, retain, um, you know, this, this uh, audience? Or how do you make them loyal to you? Got it. So I think, yeah, so I'll talk about the kind of content strategy that we have and, and I'll talk about in terms of what our kind of retention strategy is. So um, the, the content strategy essentially, um, interestingly enough, we thought that films was the mainstay of the business and we launched our originals in 2018. Um, in fact, one of the originals that we launched is actually featured in our top five content. So it's not films kind of occupying all the top five slots uh, in the region, uh, but it, one of our originals actually, which is a crime thriller, which is actually now seeped into like the number third and the number fourth slot in the region. So what we realize is that there is a significant amount of appetite for uh, both relevant existing theatrical film programming as well as new original series kind of programming, right? But again, this has to be very high quality, very high production values. And I think uh, the kind of content and the experience we have as a company allows for us to be able to produce a significant kind of quality benchmark where we're pretty much on par with Hollywood um, on, on every aspect from a technical perspective. Um, our content strategy really said is divided into three parts. We, we run the entire films, which is the catalog and new films that kind of come onto the platform. Uh, the second part of the strategy is very large, big budget originals, very similar to what Netflix and Prime Video have been doing. And the second is another interesting strategy, which we launched called Eros Now Quickie, which is actually high quality yeah. content, but um, it's essentially 80 to 100 minutes of programming cut in episodes in about eight to 10 minutes, right? Um, the reason why we did this is because we believe that there was a significant demand on a device-based play, which is mobile devices, uh, where they didn't really have too much time to maybe watch, um, you know, 90 minutes or 100 minutes or 150 minutes on the go, right? Some of the large big budget originals are anywhere between 300 to 400 minutes of content. Um, they had more of an appetite to watch maybe 30 minutes on the go, um, and that's more commute-based viewership. And there was the entire space of high-quality short-form content was missing over there. And that's another segment that we dealt with. Um, the, the key strategy really to ensuring that you're able to get retention um, is to make sure that you're able to kind of segment your audiences, understand their kind of viewing patterns, uh, where you're able to kind of cater to both what we call is the draw which kind of attracts new audiences and how they're able to get the retention strategy going from the mid to long game and i think that's where we look at our recommendation engine both look at a remarketing strategies of how do we ensure that we're able to keep platform um, consumers engaged right um, there's a yeah. significant work that goes on from a tech perspective to kind of create these cohorts of audiences um, and as my esteemed panelists have mentioned right they're not necessarily the same across the region there are very several kinds of cohorts that exist across the region and we're able to then serve to each cohort type and i think that's at the core of what we're looking to do to make, make sure that we uh, don't get that level of churn right uh, Nadine, do you want to quickly uh, touch onto this uh, uh, con consumer retention question? Yeah, sure. Um, so content is very important. I mean, let's, uh, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. Um, people follow content, um, despite the fact that sometimes they are really um, associated or they are a brand advocate for a particular platform that they really like to watch content on. Uh, they will always look for content. So if you have the right content on your platform, people are going to go definitely to the platform and, uh, you know, follow you. Um, and uh, the, the reason as well for this is that the, the, the um, you know, the situation is different from four to five years back. Four to five years back, technology was a very big challenge. So if you had the content and then your product is not really performing well or your streaming keeps on buffering, then people are not going to be there into your platform. Nowadays, the situation is a little bit different because of the uh, technological advancement and the uh, 
technology uh, differences between the platforms and the gaps are being um, smaller and smaller over over the time so from a user experience experience perspective definitely they still prefer some platforms over the other i can see that but it's not of a big gap as it used to be so accordingly what people are going to be following is content so content is is, is very important as for Wayak, and to address some of the questions because people were asking about content in, in particular, mm -hmm. our main USP is our Z library. Despite the fact that I acquire a lot of Arabic content, uh, what really makes us very special is our Z uh, uh, library that's dubbed into Arabic. Uh, a big portion of the Arabic audience really love Indian content. Uh, that's, that's a fact. And, for a lot of people, they don't know that even in, uh, uh, you know, in Egypt and in Morocco, they have a big, uh, uh, you know, they really adore that this type of content. And we realize this. And accordingly, we make sure that we get the content, the best content uh, from our library, the latest content, uh, best quality in terms of shooting. We dub it in, 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 in the best way possible, and then we make it available to the audience which accordingly addresses Mehdi's question because he was asking about, there is a wide audience between uh, Morocco to Dubai. So how can you make sure that you have uh, the right content for, for, the, for the audiences? And I agree with him. Our audience in Morocco is different than in Saudi, but at the same time, the main thing that really uh, put them together into our platform is our Indian content. So we get that uh, content and we dub it into uh, Arabic, and also we've done something very interesting is that we dubbed it into French to cater for a larger type of audience in North Africa. At the mm -hmm. same time, localization comes into picture. This question really tells everyone that localization and localized platforms are very important. So I wouldn't imagine at one point of time that a global platform will be able to substitute the local players or uh, the, the players who have targeted niche uh, audience or local, localized uh, audience. And accordingly, uh, every, uh, every OTT of us will have their own place, as long as you really, you really understand your target audience and what you are trying to offer them as uh, something that is very distinctive in the market. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That, that's really, really interesting point here. So we'll move to the next question before we actually wrap up and take some question, question from the audience. So the MENA region presents some unique, um, you know, issues that shape uh, the range of options from both uh, service provider and consumer perspective. Like um, Zara mentioned, there's a low credit card uh, penetration and mobile connectivity. In this context, a lot of, of actors are turning towards toward telcos to develop a partnership. So how do you see collaboration between telcos and, and OTT players and, uh, and the strategic consideration to, to such cooperation? So I know you all three are working with telcos and what, what do you have to say on this? Who wants to go first? I can jump. Okay. Thanks, yeah. Ali. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, what's interesting is that um, the telcos, uh, it's, a, it's a publicly known fact that um, about two thirds of data consumption on any telco or ISP pipe is actually driven by video, right? And that's the reason why you actually look at uh, video being a very core attribute to the larger telco or ISP business. Um, another factoid is a lot of the telco services uh, by nature have been commoditized over the years, right? When we talk about back in the day, when you think about 10 years ago, uh, I don't really know who uses SMS anymore, right? It's it pretty much every, everything's driven by a data package. Um, so for the telcos also to be able to increase their ARPUs and, and they will continue to get stressed in terms of ARPUs on the telco side, they need to figure mm -hmm. out how do you get customers to move from like a 1 GB to a 5 GB to a 10 GB to a 20 GB consumption per month, right? And one of the main drivers for that is actually going to be video consumption. Uh, there is native video consumption that happens uh, on multiple platforms, but how do you systematically create a strategy for customers to kind of move up the data bundle so eventually the ARPU also goes up for both the telco. Um, so around the world, we've been actually doing some very interesting 
partnerships um, uh, in the MENA region specifically. We've got alliances with Atislat, we've got alliances with Do. Um, we've done yeah. some interesting work with Vodafone recently in Qatar. We're working on some interesting things both with Shuf in terms of bundling. So there's a lot of interesting work happening across the region in terms of how we work with the telcos, both kind of going back to that some, same question of you know looking at retention and churn. Two reasons why they add significant value is because one is uh, they kind of partially solve the payment problem because it's dependent on, I wouldn't say cat your billing only but just in terms of the carrier payment cycle that's one part of it and the second part of it where it's interesting is because they're already able to kind of segment the user and understand what the user sets are so they, they kind of help us in the process of creating these cohorts um, just a couple of partnerships we'd like to talk about which which are not directly relevant to the region right now but for example we partnered with uh, eros now is amongst the only few non-us partners to actually be launched on apple channels plus when apple channels actually got launched um progressively in different parts of the world they're supposed to be live in 109 countries we were the few that were available on these kind of partners so you're able to kind of curate an experience for apple customers that is unique to them which might be slightly different for a Roku customer which is very different for maybe uh, a different kind of an OEM customer so what we do is actually work with a lot of these partners and trying to a understand what's the localization that's required understand in terms of what the customer segments are and ensure that we're able to work with them very strategically in kind of increasing month-on-month -month outputs we believe partnerships are an interesting way we've also done some interesting partnerships with the likes of Rack Bank where we're in the midst of doing a couple of very other interesting partnerships in the region that are non-telco partnerships. So I think it's a good collaborative environment. And I think digital also, unlike the offline worlds, allows the kind of ecosystem to collaborate in a better way. Right. Um, Nadeen? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, partnerships is, is, is very important and it plays a large uh, uh, part of what we do on a daily basis when it comes to uh, distribution and business development. Uh, we've partnered with many telcos, many are aggregators. We are in the uh, process of launching on a daily basis, I would say, with, the, with the, someone in you. Uh, uh, we're uh, covering, in, in MENA region, uh, we are covering most of the telcos uh, so far. Uh, and uh, we started to go outside of MENA as well. So in UK, we already uh, are available in terms of uh, uh, DCB with uh, all of the four operators in, in UK. In Canada, we are we launched with Telus as well, uh, so mm -hmm. uh, users can subscribe to Ayak through uh, their mobile uh, uh, phone numbers in there. And we are trying to expand our network more and more globally when it comes to um, uh, telcos, when it comes to uh, distribution and uh, and aggregators within other OTTs. We're open to collaborate with. Uh, um, you know, uh, global OTT players, uh, wherever they are in MENA region also, we, we are already uh, collaborating with so many um, content providers to be on our platform and at the same time for us to offer them, uh, um, you know, either uh, to be part of their bundle or uh, par part of, of their offering as well. Excellent. Zara, you want to add on to that? Yeah, that sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so, so, um, a uh, few things that I would like to, to add. Historically, telcos have been dependent on uh, SMS and voice revenue, but now uh, this heavy infrastructure that they've had, um, they found themselves in times where voice revenue is disappearing and is being cannibalized by um, uh, the different OTTs, the likes of WhatsApp calls, FaceTime, Hangout, Zoom, etc. Uh, and 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 without the telco benefiting uh, financially, so uh, so so the only way to drive preference into their platform, apart from making tweaks and offers and campaigns and discounts on their uh, mobile uh, offering, is is basically content, uh, content mainly video streaming. It's what keeps customers hooked into into their service, and it's what would help them. Uh, upgrade customers from prepaid to postpaid or from a, from, a, um, uh, from a low internet pack to higher internet pack. It what, uh, what helps improve uh, retention on their, for example, prepaid mobile uh, um, uh, subscriptions and so on. So it has it, OTT uh, platforms, a strong OTT service uh, is the way 
to monetize on their 5G investment is the way to help them upgrade customers to uh, higher ARPU or, or high tier uh, packages. So it has so so telcos have uh, so this is this is some kind of a win-win situation for us and the telcos uh, embracing OTTs on content, on gaming, on music, um, across all entertainment. So um, and yes, indeed, they have solved the payment problem uh, through their direct carrier billing and through their. Uh, billing logic as well. So with telcos, you enable smart charging. So if you can't collect the ten dollars from a customer, you collect the nine and the eight and the seven, and then this will help improve renewals by seventy to eighty percent at the end of the day. Um, so uh, today, OTTs uh, are rising on the heels of telcos, and we have partnered with all of the telcos in the region. Uh, do it is a lot, STC, Mobile, uh, Zane in uh, KSA in, in, in Kuwait, we do, etc. So we've made sure to establish tie-ups with everyone and we've made sure to improve our partnerships outside the telco world. So we went into financial services, we've partnered with Emirates MBD, with Riyadh Bank and other banks. We've also recently partnered with Dubai Airport so that we capture the customer the minute he uh, comes into uh, into the airport and that's a lead generation um, kind of partnership. So yes, it, it, is, it is crucial for all um, industries that have a base. That's, that's what we target and that's, that's what we try to develop affiliation with. That's, that's well, and that's great to hear. So, um, you know, we've almost at the end of our webinar, and uh, um, but I can see there are a lot and a lot of questions um, coming in for you three. Uh, I will be able to take maybe uh, one or two, so one or two questions. But um, just just so you know, um, our audience, uh, that um, you know, if we once we run out of time, we'll be able to actually um, send you uh, all your answers via email. So we will endeavour to get back to, to answer all your questions. So the the, the speakers will will get back to you. Um, but uh, before we actually wrap up. Um, so maybe I'll take one or two questions uh, for the panelists. So uh, maybe one, um, let's see which one, so many. So in terms of, of uh, what is the approach of producing and acquiring premium content? Are you uh, doing audience research or having a design model to, for content acquisition? Who wants to um, to go for this um, question? Do you want me to take a stab at it? Pardon? Do you want me to take a stab at it? That, that was the... I yes. Said, do you want me to oh, yes. Okay. So, yeah, yes. sure. Yes. Go, go yes. ahead. <laughs> no, so I think um, the advantage that all of us have, right? So OSN kind of recently launched, but they had significant amount of data as far as their television programming is concerned. Um, obviously, don't assume it's the same audience. Uh, so we get a lot of data sciences based on the existing consumption trends, right? But it's not about using that primarily. It's about looking at how you're able to actually predict some trends based on a lot of the data that you already have and kind of plan for going forward. So I think um, three or four key things when you think about developing a piece of content, right? One is looking at how data can guide you, uh, looking for stories and, and being able to drive like a deep narrative. Because is if you've seen the most successful shows in the world, you're either associating with a certain space or you're associating with a certain character. So the deep narrative becomes important. Uh, what's become very important in the world of content creation is the concept of the writer's room, right? So how you're able to do research with that particular kind of audience set in terms of who you're targeting and how do you spend some time kind of writing and rewriting some of these projects. And, and every part of that content development project, right, from the writer's room to the script to the casting, then to the final kind of production and post-production that becomes relevant. So it's almost like earlier films were about 100, 120 minutes. Now you're almost creating films that are about 300 minutes or 400 minutes. So I think uh, sometimes 
uh, and historically broadcast has been also about volume of content. I think specifically OTT is going to be a lot about quality, about the depth, so that you're able to kind of build franchises around multiple season of IPs. And, and that shows by the depth of the work that goes into the creation of the first season. And I think that's the part from a culture perspective, at least globally, is, is seeming to be the trend going forward. Thank you, Ali. Um, so our next question will go. We will we'll talk about content, premium content. Do you believe that the exclusive content concept can impact the the, the pricing strategy? Maybe. I'll take that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Zahra, if you want to contribute, go ahead. Okay, so I, um, it's, it's an interesting question, actually. I've been uh, thinking about it since the, the time it was uh, posted. Mm. So, um, in my opinion, I don't think uh, that much. It should impact you that much. I'll tell you the reason. Um, in your list of um, uh, points that you need to evaluate to come up with your subscription packs and um, the different subscription packs when it comes to currencies, when it comes to duration, when it comes to um, uh, you know, uh, packages that's available through telcos or third parties and so on. So there are a lot of decisions that you need to take in terms of um, having this package with the right amount of content, with the right uh, um, exclusive content per se, and then the right pricing. Now, when it comes to the pricing, I think, uh, uh, you know, the exclusivity of the content, even if you have like the most exclusive content should be coming at the bottom of your uh, priority list. Uh, why? Because you have, first of all, you have a lot of competition. So you need to, to understand really what your competition is offering at what price and where. Then you have, uh, you know, uh, the individual countries and the economies uh, around the country. Then if the appetite of the payment in that country. So there are plenty of elements that will determine your pricing or has a priority in your determination or drives your pricing more than if you have an exclusive content. Actually, if you don't have an exclusive content, you should not be looking at a subscription pack from the beginning. So this is more of a, something that needs to be there. But to be honest with you, even if I uh, add more exclusive content into my packs, I don't go and revise the, the pricing for it. I don't think this is, uh, this is something that is uh, really key in driving the pricing of that package. Yeah, yeah, true. I, I agree that I guess, Exclusivity plays a role. It does contribute to a certain extent. It will drive preference into the platform and people will be jumping from one platform to another um, and looking to watch this, uh, this content and it will get them to pay you as well the subscription at the end of the month. Uh, however, we need to look into the content mix. Not the majority of the content uh, uh, should be uh, exclusive. There is the right mix between what's exclusive and what's not. People on OTT platforms like to binge watch. Uh, they like to get hooked to um, uh, to uh, box sets and there is what we the evergreen content. Uh, so we still see people uh, watching the Titanic. Uh, we still see people uh, watching or looking for Jean-Claude Van Damme and, and, and these old movies. However, it is um, exclusive content is what uh, is what 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 get people to to what drives people to to actually pay. And then looking into the pricing, it depends on on your strategy. What do you? How do you want to position yourself? Uh, how mature the market is? Are you an attacker in 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 that market? Are you uh, someone uh, whose sole purpose is to achieve penetration and to be in every home very quickly, the timeline and the, and the, and the share of, of, of wallet uh, from, uh, from that base you're, you're targeting? Uh, Egypt today is different than uh, KSA and uh, UAE in the purchasing power and the credit card penetration and the ability to pay and so on. So pricing strategy is really different by country by the maturity of that country and the availability of the different modes of payment. Okay, um, so I will take a last question. So just looking at, um, you know, one of the um, questions that everyone can... Sorry, so many. 
Um, are the churn rates back to usual since uh, in MENA, um, you know, you, you guys are back, are not on lockdown anymore? So what are the churn rates are, um, are streamers typically observing? Is that directed to you? Okay. So the question is that since the lockdown is over, the question is in terms of what are the churn rates that uh, streamers observing? Is that the question, if I've understood that correctly? Right. So I yes. think that depends. Yeah, I think that depends on a lot of factors, right? Because of the lockdown, what happened was um, some of the productions in terms of the new productions were halted, right? So I think with lockdown mm -hmm. opening, at least the production economy kind of opens out. I can talk about for Eros now. Um, we had close to about... Uh, um, 70 to 100 percent increase in engagement metrics uh, when you compare a pre-lockdown and a post-lockdown scenario. Um, and when we say engagement metric, I'm using that loosely. It's to broadly classify some of the key headers like uh, unique subscribers. It's a combination of that. It's a combination of time spent, combination of frequency of visits per week. So it's a combination of all those things. I think the at least for us, we've seen not a significant drop because we were actually able to launch two shows that were completely shot in lockdown. So we've seen a minor correction, um, maybe like a few single digit percentile that's kind of after the lockdown. Um, more importantly, some of the session times have gone down, but we feel that that's a short term correction over the period of the next two, three months, uh, because we believe that eventually it's the people that have actually tasted the product, they've liked the product, they've sampled the product, they've subscribed to it, and they potentially will come back based on some sort of a um, maybe like in a month or two when we launch a new firm or a new show. So I think the the increase uh, to some extent, we did anticipate that there might be a minor correction coming when the lockdown does open out. Uh, but we've seen the overall kind of base remain fairly stable in that regard. And um, Zara, you want to add on to that? Because that will be the last question before we wrap up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, I guess, I guess, sure. now, uh, during lockdown, yes, we, we have seen more than 10 times the engagement that we see uh, prior and, and post uh, lockdown. Now the engagement has uh, has stabilized and I would say it has been an abnormal period for everybody because it was lockdown combined with Ramadan, uh, uh, the time during which people have a very, very strong appetite for Arabic. So people were hooked into the Ramadan uh, series and, and uh, uh, content. Uh, now we see that the market have stabilized, but I do not think that um, as of now uh, we see the real uh, impact because 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 the, the, nobody uh, is being able to assess the real economic impact um, that is going to happen and that I believe we're going to see we're yet to see in the next uh, two to three months. As of now. Uh, we're, we're still growing, we're still acquiring, we're still engaging and people are sticking to the service because they see OTT platforms as a good um, a substitute for, uh, for other expensive services. We're still in the range of $10. It's very affordable and it's, uh, it's great quality. Uh, however, uh, the impact of people leaving the country or the impact of people not coming back at all after they've left is yet to be seen. And uh, till now, uh, I don't think anyone is able to assess what's going to happen in the mm -hmm. next three to four months. Nadine, do you want to add uh, like a few words before we, we conclude? Yeah, actually, I'd like to add this, uh, two points here. Uh, Nancy was asking if Wayak and Z5 are different. And I'd like to say, yes, they are yes. Uh, completely two different products with two different uh, strategies when it comes to content and, 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 and product and marketing and everything. So it's completely separate. The target audience is separate. And then um, Ian was asking the very interesting question about the um, uh, budgets and uh, uh, what is the percentage of the budget between the content and the technology. Um, uh, and I, I like actually to, to tell you that uh, normally the way that I look into it is that uh, maybe it would be a surprise to some is that um, the uh, technology budget, despite the fact that it's very big and it's very important and so on, it will probably consist a third of the uh, one third of the content budget and maybe less. Um, not just to tell you that the technology budget is small, no, just that you know that mm -hmm. the content budget should be really 
high in order to um, you know to satisfy the cravings of your uh, end user and the amount of content that you need to have uh, within your uh, library. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, even though we wanted to just keep on in, until the the end of the afternoon, but um, I would like to again thank you. The, thank the three of you. You guys have been um, wonderful, and also to the audience who have taken the time to join us today. Um, just so uh, remember that uh, Data Access is running free virtual events until the end of the year. So please uh, continue to check our website regularly to register. And also this, uh, this webinar, uh, the recording and the presentation will be um, available as of tomorrow on our website. Uh, so um, feel free to check us, um, check, check this as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Zara, Nadine and Ali. And um, so we'll, we'll definitely be, be bring, continue this conversation until, until the end of 2020. Thank you and good afternoon to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.